Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about karyotype, but before we get started we need to do a little review of some of the previous terms that we've learned so that when we talk about karyotype we can use these terms. So starting with the difference between diploid versus haploid. So a diploid cell is what's usually in your body uh, as your somatic cells. So most of your cells are actually diploid cells, meaning that there are two sets of chromosomes. Why are there two sets? Because you get one set of chromosome from your mother and one set of your chromosomes from your dad. So together you have two sets of chromosomes that determine everything that's going on in your body. So that's a diploid cell. There's also something called a gamete, which is what a diploid individual pass on to the offspring. So people or organisms like us that go through sexual reproduction will pass on a haploid cell, which is half of the amount of chromosomes uh, that we have, so that we can combine that with another gamete and produce another diploid individual as an offspring. So what is said over here in most eukaryotes, right? We are eukaryotes, we are multicellular eukary eukaryotes, our somatic cells, so for example, our skin cells, brain cells, lung cells, red blood cells, these are all diploid um, cells. So there are two sets or two N of chromosomes. And, and this gives us two complete sets of chromosomes, one inherited from each parent, like I just said. And the meiosis, which is the product that produces gamete, splits the two sets of chromosomes, right? During meiosis one, we have our homologous chromosomes paired up and they split from each other. So that gives us haploid daughter cells that we can pass on to the offspring. So again, gametes are uh, then combined in sexual reproduction to form a diploid offspring. So you get half or, or one set and another set together, you get two sets for a diploid offspring. Now, when we're talking about diploid versus haploid, diploid means we have two sets of chromosomes in one cell, but whenever we have two sets of chromosomes, there are chromosomes that can pair up with each other. That's why we call it two sets. So those are called homologous chromosomes, a pair of chromosome. So these are not just any chromosome at all. They're paired up for a reason. They're paired up because they have the same uh, sets of genes. So when we talk about homologous chromosomes, one is from mom, one is from dad, and we can pair them up because they're similar and they're not identical. So if you look on the picture on the right, we have eye color gene on one homologous chromosome, and then on the other homologous chromosome, you'll carry the eye color gene at the same place, the same location or locus on the chromosome. And then we have blood type gene, and then you have blood type gene on the other side as well. These genes are the same kind of gene, meaning that it's coding for the same trait or the same protein. However, they don't have to be identical. For example, we have hair color here, which means hair color has to be over here, but this one could be brown hair color. This one could be uh, blonde hair color, right? Uh, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Your eye color, for example, could be the same for from both parents. This could be brown eye color and this could be brown eye color as well. So homologous chromosomes are definitely not identical because it carries so many, so many different genes. And for some genes, you can have the same version of the same gene, but sometimes you might not, right? So we call that, this, the, a certain version of a gene, we call that uh, the alleles. These are variations of the same gene. So each homologous chromosomes carry the same set of genes at the same location, but the variations may or may not be the same. Um, so that's what we have, homologous chromosome. So here we have two pictures of two types of karyotypes. So a karyotype is basically you have a cell, you take a screenshot of it, you take a picture of it, and then you rearrange the chromosomes so that the ones that's supposed to be paired up, you pair them up, and then you see, uh, do we have the right number of chromosomes? Are the chromosomes the right size? Is everything fine in terms of, you know, just the size and the numbers of chromosomes um, to identify whether a certain individual has uh, or may or may not be carrying a genetic disease. So when you look on the picture on the right, we have a diploid cell. As you can see, we have for each type of chromosome, we have a pair of chromosomes. So this is a diploid cell where we have 23 pairs of chromosomes or two sets of 23 chromosomes. This is also what we call a somatic cell because we have two sets of chromosomes, right? So this, although it looks like an X shape because the two chromosomes aren't attached in the middle, this is not a duplicated chromosome, just two individual chromosomes that are paired up. It just so happened that it kind of looks like an X shape, okay? Um, so this process of uh, 
mitosis is what creates more somatic cells. So uh, this is a cell that has gone through mitosis. So you should also know that mitosis is what provides diploid cells. And then we have haploid cells, which had gone through meiosis, and haploid cells are gametes. Haploid cell only has one of each type of chromosome, and as you can see, we have 23 chromosomes, 23 individual chromosomes, and there is no pair at all. So this is our gamete and is created by meiosis. So when we're looking at a karyotype, we can also talk about um, something called autosomes versus sex chromosomes. So the autosomes are all the first 22 pairs. They're always arranged in this order. So the first 22 pairs are not in charge of determining a person's biological sex, right? Whether this individual is a male or a female. So in this human uh, somatic cell, you can tell that uh, the sex chromosomes that are carried is X and Y. Right? They could be paired up if you put Y over here, it's still X and Y. So XY um, tells us that this is a male and XX is a female. But on the right side, you actually can't tell whether this is a male or a female because it carries an X chromosome and male and female both carry an X chromosome. So both male and female can pass on an X chromosome. But still, this is a sex chromosome and all the first 22 are autosomes. They do not code for a person's sex. So again, autosomes versus sex chromosome. You should know that a human somatic cell contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, but out of those 23 pairs, 22 of those pairs were 20, uh, or 44 of those individual chromosomes are called autosomes. And they look the same in both males and females, obviously. M depending on who you are, all your genes, well, there are a lot of parts of your genes that are different. Um, depending on who you are, right? But they look the same if you were to look at a karyotype of it. And then the 23rd pairs are sex chromosome. When you have two copies of the, of the X chromosome, then you have male, and then, oh, well, but then you have a female. If you were to have an X and a Y chromosome, that is a male. Correct, okay. So here's what might be a little bit confusing for you, but just remember, anytime you see a word ending in zomes, we're talking about chromosomes, in a cell, those are the actual genetic information. But whenever you look at a cell or, or a gamete, those are cells. There are a lot of chromosomes inside the cell, but those are different types of cells. Is it your skin cell? Is it your brain cell? Is it the, the gametes? Is it sperms and eggs? You know, those are cells. But autosomes versus sex chromosomes, those are individual chromosomes in the cell. And every single cell actually carries both autosomes and chromosome uh, and sex chromosome at the same time. Okay, so make sure you understand which one is talking about genes and DNAs and genetic material, and which one is talking about different types of cells. Uh, we don't need that. Oops. Okay, so now that we've learned all these words, we can finally go into what a karyotype is. So what is a karyotype? It's the process of pairing and ordering all the chromosomes. So we take a snapshot of a cell during the stage of mitosis or meiosis because that's when the chromosomes are condensed and that's when you can actually tell the differences between different chromosomes. So you take a screenshot of or a snapshot of the cell and then you reorder and pair them up, you pair up the chromosomes so that you can tell uh, do we have the correct numbers of chromosomes or is there something missing or do we have too many of a certain type of chromosome? You have to identify which type um, of chromosome is uh, had gone through something called non-disjunction, which we'll talk about in a minute. The source, so the point of using a karyotype is that we use it to identify birth defects or genetic disorders, same idea, and even cancers, right? So a karyotype can be taken of gametes or of a, of a child's body, and we can see if there's an abnormal numbers of chromosomes, but you can also, you can also take a karyotype of your skin cell, for example, and see whether this cell had gone through a certain mutation that had um, you know that caused it to have an abnormal numbers of chromosome which could make this cell cancerous so how is a karyotype made again it's made during mitosis or meiosis actually and what you do is that you uh, you find you wait until this cell has gone to has gone through mitosis and meiosis is in the process of mitosis and meiosis, but you want to stay at the metaphase because during anaphase, the, the chromosomes was separate and, and that's, that will give you the wrong number of chromosomes because now you're kind of doubling um, the chromosomes. 
if they were to be meta phase two. Anyway, so but but the idea that ana phase two. But the idea is we're trying to make sure that all the chromosomes are still there. They're still condensed. And they're not the homologous chromosomes aren't split yet, right? If this were to be one chromosome, if you split, then then you get double the, the number of chromosomes. So then, um, once you look at all these chromosomes, how do you pair them up? So first, you can look at the lengths of the chromosome. Some chromosomes are longer than the other ones. So if you see two chromosomes that are at the same length, it's possible that they can be paired up together. However, there are a lot of chromosomes that are that look like they have the same length. So then you can also look at something called the central mirror position, right? Where is the, the that, that dense part of the chromosome um, in the central mirror position? Could be different. And then lastly, when you're looking at chromosomes, you have to stain them. So when you stain those chromosomes, the pattern of the staining could also be different. And if the staining pattern of two chromosomes are the same length, that have the same central mirror position, then those two chromosomes can be paired together. All right, so when we're talking about staining, you don't have to know a lot of detail, but you should know that the point of doing the staining process is to show you different banding patterns because different parts of a certain type of chromosome could have a different numbers of A and T pairs. The darker, or the darker a certain region of a chromosome is, that means there is more A and T pair instead of C and G pairs. So depending on which chromosome it is, the staining pattern of which part is dark and which part is light will be different. It's also really important for you to remember that even though this one band seems very small, it actually has a lot of genes in it. Okay, so now we can take a look at another picture. So on the left side, this is when the cell gets arrested or when you stop the cell from dividing, you just kind of take a picture of it. Same over here. And then when you look on the right, again, X and Y don't have to be paired together for them to be the 23rd pair of chromosomes. There are the 23rd pair of chromosomes, no matter what, okay? Um, they, could, they could be right next to each other. It really, it really depends. It doesn't really matter, right? You have 22 pairs of autosomes and you have one last pair of sex chromosome. This is X and Y, so that tells you this is a male. And then on the bottom, you have your regular 23 pairs of chromosomes. There's no abnormalities over here. And then you have the last pair of chromosome, which is XX. Um, you can tell they're XX even if they're not labeled because they're all the same size. And the Y chromosome is a little bit smaller than the X chromosome. Actually, a lot smaller. Um, all right, so this will be a female. And then lastly, there is a concept called non-disjunction. This is what causes an abnormal numbers of chromosomes. So non-disjunction is the process of not separating chromosomes. How does this happen? So this happens during either the anaphase one of meiosis or anaphase two of meiosis or anaphase of mitosis. So during anaphase one of meiosis, that's when homologous chromosomes, the two X shapes, supposed to separate from each other, but if they don't separate from each other, then you'll end up with an abnormal numbers of chromosomes or during meiosis two or mitosis, then the homologous chromosomes are supposed to separate from each other. And if they don't, you'll end up with an abnormal amount of chromosomes. So uh, the result of this is either the cell will have one too many or one too little or more than that. But there's a word for it called aneuploidy. This is when we describe a cell not having the correct numbers of chromosomes called aneuploidy. So if you look over here, non-disjunction non -disjunction in action. So over here we have meiosis 1, where homologous chromosomes are supposed to separate, and it didn't. And now you end up with some cells with more than normal number of chromosomes and some with less. Or if you were to look at meiosis 2 of um, meiosis 2. Meiosis 2, where the cis chromatid is supposed to separate. And if it doesn't, then you'll end up with some cells that has too many or too little as well. So this can happen during mitosis as well, but if you think about it, if any of these happen and the child ends up with one of these cells, then this child is going to have an ab number, abnormal numbers of chromosomes. Okay? Lastly, there are two words that we can use to describe certain scenarios of aneuploidy. One is called trisomic, one is called monosomic. So trisomic means a certain cell that has one extra of a certain type of chromosome, right? We have our 23 pairs of chromosomes. For any of these 23 pairs, 
if instead of one pair, instead of two chromosomes, you have three, then you will call it trisomic. Or instead of one pair, you have one, then you will call it monosomic. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at this activity that we did in class so that you can see how a question can be asked about karyotyping. All right, so if you were to take a look at this karyotype on the bottom right, you can tell that this uh, this individual is containing a certain type of mutation, right? An abnormality, an aneuploidy. So how do you know which, what's the problem, right? How, how do you know what the problem is? You look at each pair, you see that there's not 23 pairs. On the last pair, you have three instead of two, right? You're supposed to have X, X, or X, Y, and this is not what you're seeing over here. So this is where the problem is. Instead of two X chromosomes, you are seeing in three X chromosomes. And then you look at the description of all the disorder and you see that the one, oh, okay. The one that's called triplo X syndrome is or trisomy X uh, is the type of disorder that gives a certain individual an extra X chromosome. Instead of two X chromosomes, you have three, right? And let's do another example. If you were to look at this one right here, actually, let's do a look at this one right here. Um, what is the problem? You look at this karyotyping, you can see that for chromosome number 21, instead of two chromosomes, you have three. So uh, if you look at the information, the uh, Down syndrome has three um, chromosome number 21, okay? But any of these could happen. All right, lastly, I wanna go over this chart with you because, um, in case you have questions. So somatic cells are always diploid, right? As we already talked about, and gametes are haploid. And again, somatic cell has diploid because you get one set of chromosomes from mom, one set from dad, so we can also call it 2N. Gametes are haploid, so we can also call it N, right? N could be any number, depending on what kind of individual or what kind of species you are. So are they formed during mitosis, meiosis, Right? These are the processes that create more somatic cells and gametes. Are there homologous chromosomes? Yes, because you have pairs of chromosomes. No, because there is no pairs of chromosomes. Two sets, one set. How many alleles of each gene? Two alleles of each gene, one allele of, of each gene. Right. The whole point is when you have homologous chromosomes, you get one variation from mom and one variation from dad. How many chromosomes should this human cell contain in total? It should be 46 or 23 pairs. And for gamete, you should have only 23. How many autosomes? So within this one cell, we're now talking about individual chromosomes. So there should be 44 or 22 pairs of chromosomes um, that are autosomes. And you should have 22 individual chromosomes that are autosomes in a gamete. For a sex chromosome, uh, somatic cells should have two or one pair of sex chromosome, either XX or XY. If you are a female or a male. And then we have gametes that only have one sex chromosome. It's either X or Y. Okay, that's the end of the video. I hope you learned something.